biggest money-making sitcom on television is officially down a man. These videos are not for children. If you are a children, then piss off. This hey there, I'm Vien Fuso, and let's get this out of the way now. There are some of you who are going to claim that Two and a Half Men died the day that it was created. And I get that the show is lowbrow humor, but can we stop acting like enjoying lowbrow humor is something to be shat upon? I love the classics. I love well thought out movies and shows that provide you with emotional investment and overall attachment. I love when art can make me think about it all hours of the night, or just randomly when I should probably be doing something else. Like releasing the next video in my NWO series, guys, I'll get to it, I promise. I'm just too busy thinking about the show Angel and why it did me like that. I was a kid and I was tuning in to see somebody fight a dragon and it never, it just fucking never happened. However, I also like the movie Elf. There is nothing wrong with enjoying mindless entertainment. Not everything needs to be thought-provoking and deep. Sometimes people just like being entertained. And I don't care what you say, I would much rather watch a full marathon start to finish of this series rather than watch so much as one singular episode of The Big Bang Theory. I don't care. I don't care. You can hate me in the comments. But now that we got that opening rant out of the way, for the people who actually watched this show and were somewhat fond of it, this is the day... Two and a half men died. Dead, 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 dead. Charlie is dead, dead. Killed him off because he was a cokehead. Just in case you didn't watch the show, but you are for some reason watching my video. Which I found out that some of you do, and it confuses me, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Two and a Half Men was a show about two brothers, one successful in every venture in life, that being Charlie, and one a complete failure in every venture in life, that being Alan. After getting divorced and kicked out of his home, Alan is forced to move in with his much more successful older brother. He brings along his son Jake. And while Charlie is annoyed by Alan's mere existence, he grows fond of his nephew and allows them to stay for a lot longer than he initially agreed to. In the show, Jake was sort of more of a plot device than he was a character, while Charlie and Alan were the series' leads. So you might imagine when Uncle Charlie had his very real, real-life breakdown, where he told anyone who put a microphone in his face that he was winning, had tiger blood, and completely detested showrunner Chuck Lorre, while also taking public jabs at his co-star John Cryer, you could imagine that it didn't exactly sit well with the cast and the crew. But believe it or not, the fictional world's most eligible bachelor actually almost walked away from the show following season 7. This is despite the fact that earlier that same season the show was put on hiatus so that he could enter rehab for his continued drug use. His reason for leaving the show was due solely to feeling that he was worth more than one million dollars per episode. One million dollars per episode? Dude, I won't, I, I won't ever see one million dollars in my life. And that might be with every paycheck combined. You just show up to work and say a couple lines. Look, I'm not saying acting is easy, but God damn it, Charlie, take the money. Anyway, eventually a compromise was reached, and Charlie made out of the situation making a little under $2 million per episode, making him the highest paid actor in TV at that time. Despite this, Charlie's troubles continued, and it continued to be a detriment to the series. He'd enter rehab no less than three times that year, thereby halting the production of the series. But season eight of Two and a Half Men was very troubled, and a lot of it, if not all of it, falls on Charlie Sheen and his erratic behavior. Following a Christmas break, Charlie returned to work, having lost about 20 pounds and gained about 20 years. According to cast and crew, he suddenly had more difficulty reading and remembering his lines. 
And despite this, he would still very often miss show rehearsals. While I personally couldn't find too many moments of Charlie seeming out of it while on camera, I did notice an increase in shots, leading me to believe that they were working around more takes than usual, and that there might be some validity in Charlie screwing up a whole lot of scenes. Regardless, I don't think anyone could argue that there is definitely a physical change in this man. This is what he looked like in Season 7. Here's what he looked like in Season 8. These were filmed a year apart. Not to mention, the guy just looks unnaturally sweaty. While I couldn't find him messing up per se, and editing probably plays a big part in that, I do want to note that he also didn't have the same delivery he once did. And I don't know if that's due to drug use or just simply not caring anymore. But I'm gonna go ahead and say it's probably both. It's also alleged that Charlie was so out of it during filming that he either insisted or production decided it was just easier to shoot most of his scenes with him sitting on the couch. And seeing as there seems to be an excess amount of those shots this season, there might be some truth in that. His behavior alienated those he worked with, but everyone did their best to turn a blind eye. Because of the age-old rule, you don't bite the hand that feeds. Unfortunately, that was not a rule that Charlie himself lived by as he began publicly attacking show creator Chuck Lorre. Charlie began going on very bizarre and very public rants on Chuck, causing the show to cease production yet again mid-season. This led to the series losing $10 million. Not only did his drug use have an effect on his own career, but it also had an effect on everybody he worked with. And in case you weren't picking it up, it wasn't a positive effect. But still, Charlie continued his rants and bizarre behavior, as seen in this nice highlight reel I made for you guys. But it's at this point because of psychological distress, oh my god, it's three mil an episode. Take it or leave it. Do you owe CBS an apology? No. They owe me a big one, publicly, while licking my feet. CBS has finally said enough is enough, pulling the plug on Sheen's hit program after he let loose with a scathing and some would say anti-Semitic rant against the show's creator. But it's nothing decided the at a certain Heim Levine, yeah, that's Chuck's real name, uh, mistook this rock star for his own selfish exit strategy, bro. Last I checked, Heim spent, I think, close to the last decade effortlessly and magically converting your, your tin cans into pure gold. CBS didn't see the humor and canceled the entire rest of the season. Now I can take all of the bazillions and I never have to put on those silly shirts. Charlie Sheen and Chuck Lorre haven't spoken since the shutdown, but in our interview, Sheen wanted to address Chuck directly. If sad and stupid had a foul odor attached, it would be you, fuck Bory. This contaminated little maggot can't handle my power. Clearly, I have defeated this earthworm with my words. Imagine what I would have done with my fire-breathing fists. You gotta hate that your stage name rhymes with suck. Personally, I find it perfect. <laughs> Clearly someone who believes he is above the law. Well, you've been warned, dude. Bring it. If Chuck Lorre is watching right now, yeah. I imagine he probably is. He should be. What do you want to say to him? You picked a fight with a warlock, you little worm. Why is it when I was ready to return to work, you told me there are no scripts ready to shoot? When you were told that the crew would suffer gravely as a result of your dictatorial laziness, would you please explain what you meant by your statement? They are not my problem. I can't speak for them. I'm just putting these out there because I think they're... They warrant an explanation. Clearly, he didn't bring gum for everyone. And at this point in time, Charlie Sheen was inescapable. He was everywhere. You turned on any, any news network. You listened to TMZ. You simply logged on the internet. It didn't matter. He was everywhere. Speaking to everybody and anybody who would listen. And many who wouldn't, too. He even got a pretty popular autotune remix. That's how I roll. T Pain, eat your heart out. Charlie's actions, most notably what the studio believed were anti Semitic comments, led to his permanent exodus from the show. Both CBS and Warner Brothers decided that the dude from Wall Street just wasn't worth the trouble he caused, or the paychecks that were written. And just like that, the show's most bankable star, the reason for its existence practically, was fired. And given his behavior, it's a very understandable decision, but it couldn't have been an easy one. See, while Charlie was a problem for the show, he was also the one that was bringing in viewers. So this was going to be a big blow to the show's fan base. Charlie Harper was easily everyone's favorite character on the show. 
He was sarcastic. He was witty. He was rich. He had a different beautiful woman hanging off his arm every six or seven episodes. The show kind of brought Charlie Sheen back to relevancy. Even today, I think Charlie Sheen is probably best known for this show and his very public meltdowns that follow. And that's really saying something, as he's more remembered for this than being the brother of the Mighty Ducks coach. The Mighty Duck man, I swear to God. Charlie Sheen had been playing this character for eight seasons by this point. So a lot of fans had to have seen the writing on the wall. This was clearly going to be the end of Two and a Half Men. But as a very flamboyant, mustached, wise man once sang, the show must go on. And it did. The departure of Charlie was undoubtedly felt throughout the rest of the show's run. His absence left a major void in the series. I knew plenty of people who loved the series but just flat out stopped watching after Charlie was axed off. And I can't really blame them. Because how often does a show continue on without its lead and is still somehow considered a success? The answer is Saved by the Bell and that's it. That's the only one. Cue the hordes of comments telling me that I'm clearly mistaken. Charlie didn't just play a pivotal role in the show. For a lot of viewers, he was the show. This would be like How I Met Your Mother continuing their series for three or four seasons without Barney Stinson. My point is, he was the main reason a lot of people tuned in. So naturally, when he was fired, it was the main reason for a lot of people tuning out. They picked a fight with a warlock. You get nothing. I want a party like Charlie Sheen. I want a party like Charlie Sheen. Even after Charlie Sheen picked up his last paycheck, the show wasn't content with letting it end there. Like that 70s show, Two and a Half Men wanted to let their viewers get their fix of nostalgia by constantly referencing the lead who left. And also like that 70s show, the series would use every given opportunity to further bury this character. For starters, he was killed off screen. Which is the lamest and laziest way of killing a character off. Though granted, given the situation and Charlie Sheen's psychosis, it's an understandable decision. I'll, I'll give it a pass. The first episode following Sheen's departure from the series was Charlie Harper's funeral, in which it's implied that he gave every woman there each a different STD. And the power of hindsight just kind of makes that a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? This just a little bit. These were a bunch of women that were previously seen on the show before. Charlie's flings and even long-term ex-girlfriends or fiancés. They're all in attendance to celebrate Charlie's death. Which is especially weird considering he didn't end on bad terms with all of these women. And it kind of paints all of them in a really negative light. And for as far as some of their characters go, this feels really out of character for them. But hey, I mean, whatever gets you to a punchline. At some point in time, Alan suffers a complete mental breakdown when realizing how much he truly misses his brother. And he starts handling his grief by acting out and trying to replicate his brother in every way. We're talking mannerisms and bowler shirt included. He even gets a dame or two. This goes so far that he actually begins to start calling himself Charlie, supposedly believing himself to be his brother who passed. This erratic behavior gets him sent to a mental hospital. A season later, Alan suffers a heart attack and is sent to the emergency room, where he's visited by... Charlie, now played by Kathy Bates. That's the thing that happened. Serving as Alan's spirit guide, Charlie explains that he was sent to hell and now as a punishment inhabits the body of an older, larger woman for his past devious ways. At first, Charlie tries to guide Alan into being more independent, but in reality, Charlie's still rotten as ever and just wanted to finally kick Alan out of his house. Charlie is kept in an urn that is sometimes kept in the living room and at other times is kept in the liquor cabinet. And his remains are shown to sometimes be in the urn and at other times all over the floor, as it's dropped on numerous occasions. In his absence, the show conjured up an illegitimate daughter who had never been seen, heard, or referenced before. I mean, yeah, sure, Charlie was a ladies' man who would have more than likely knocked somebody up and fathered a kid. But to knowingly not be a part of that child's life, I, I don't know, it just, it makes him come off that much more cruel. You would think that after he connected with Jake, maybe he would have tried to reconnect with his own daughter. That no one besides him seemed to know existed. I don't know, it just makes me look at the character unfavorably. Every time he's brought up in the series after Charlie Sheen's exit from the show, it for the most part is almost always negative. We never met, but I'm the guy who took your place. Thanks for giving up your house. I guess you didn't really give it up, you died. You have to be on crack to give up all this. <laughs> oh! 
Even his former housekeeper, who he had a good relationship with, Berta often compares Charlie to Walden, being a lot more favorable to the latter rather than the former. All of this seems to be done as a big middle finger to Charlie Sheen, but at the end of the day, they just really stuck it to Charlie Harper. I get why this was done. I understand creative venting. Believe you me, I used to have a series where I, I pretty much made fun of everybody I knew. But the problem here is when you have an already established character, and you're using how you feel about the person, in trying to insult the actor, you instead insult the character. And by extension, kind of the audience. And yeah, sure, Charlie Harper was obviously modeled off Charlie Sheen. Because all of Charlie Sheen's roles are modeled off of Charlie Sheen. It's like the guy gets on the phone and straight up says, if I'm not playing myself, I'm not interested. And then they give him several million dollars and, and, and he does it. But Charlie Harper was still a character that was created, fleshed out, and further developed for the better part of a decade. A character that we invited into our living rooms for the last eight years. And we saw him start off as a narcissistic, sociopathic ladies man, and over time slowly evolve into a slightly less narcissistic, sociopathic ladies man. And yeah, sure, the character started off as a one-note joke. He had two character traits. The first is getting laid, the second is wearing something like that and managing to get laid. But he was also kind of an in-depth human being. We saw him have genuine feelings and want to give up his lifestyle and try to pursue love. We've seen him be compassionate and help Alan and Jake out of situations, even if it was sometimes begrudgingly. Charlie Harper wasn't an all-around bad dude, so it was a smack in the face for a lot of people to see him now being written as a completely unlikable excuse of a human being after his character had already passed. Chuck Lorre basically took all previously established good qualities about the character and just threw them out while taking a spotlight and putting it on all the negative aspects about this character. Though I will give him credit, there are a couple cases here and there that are surprisingly not all awful, including Alan getting access to old journals Charlie left behind and learning that his brother saw a bright future for his nephew and also somewhat admired Alan despite years of teasing him. And that is shockingly pleasant. It's a nice little touch showing that he did care. Charlie Sheen and Two and a Half Men had a very symbiotic relationship, which is why after they split up, both sides kept seemingly obsessing about each other. Charlie kept talking about the show, and the show just kept on referencing Charlie. Seriously, there were a lot of mentions. I'm just giving you the spark notes here. Even the two-part series finale was entirely focused on a potential return of the character. Mind you, this is four years and seasons since he was last on the show. Even in his absence, they desperately tried to keep his presence alive. Despite the fact that they literally killed him. Which I guess is nice in theory, but not so great in execution. And by the way, for everyone wondering, I'm not going to be talking about the finale here. That's going to get its own video. There's a lot to unpack with that one. I'd also like to note that, like the show, this video will continue to be haunted by Charlie Sheen, despite him already having been dismissed. Winning. My name's Ashton Kutcher, and I sound like a preteen boy. When it was determined that the show would continue on without Charlie, there was a lot of buzz about who would be written in as his new replacement. Some claimed we'd see the return of Joey Tribbiani. Others said Uncle Jesse was men bound. There were even some people who believed that this was going to be Rob Lowe's cable comeback. And if you can believe it or not, Hugh Grant even turned down this role. They talked to me about it, but the problem was uh, they didn't have a script or a new character. They just said, trust us, we'll create one. I said, well, it's very difficult for me to consider this without a script. I'm, I'm too scared to sign up without a script. But alas, in the end, the role was given to Ashton Kutcher, a move that excited some and confused many others. Ashton literally emerges from the ashes of Charlie in his very first appearance on the show, playing a heartbroken billionaire in need of a friend. Long story short, he buys Charlie's beach house from Alan, who can't really afford to live there, so... And then he winds up allowing Alan, and by extension his son Jake, part-time, to continue living there with him, rent-free. Alan and Jake, who are, mind you, complete strangers to this man, living in the same house, free. Now if that sounds a bit far-fetched, it's probably because it is but it sounds worse than it actually was in execution. Now, I don't know if I could say that Walden Schmidt is Mary Sue, because his billions were earned through hard work and intelligence. 
What I will say is that unfortunately, Walden Schmidt kind of has a lot in common with Randy Pearson. Basically, what I'm saying is that Walden is developed as being the perfect human being. He's kind, he's good hearted, he's a genius level intellect, he's good looking, women throw themselves at him, he's rich, he's well endowed. They gave this guy everything. He was kind of written to have it all. And writing a picture-perfect person doesn't exactly breed comedy gold. He's too nice, so it's not as funny when bad things happen to him. He's beyond rich, so he can buy himself in and out of almost any situation. He's a genius, so it's not likely that he'll be outsmarted. I don't know, I just felt like he was given way too many positive attributes, which is never good for a character, and especially not good for a newly introduced replacement of a character. It seemed like the show was trying to overcompensate for Charlie's absence. The only thing that's worse is when the show finally gets around to giving him faults and flaws, and they're the most boring ones! Despite his semi-playboy lifestyle, Walden is not only girl crazy, but also lovesick. The guy's a regular Ted Mosby. He's so ready to just find the one and fall in love that he's willing to skip a couple steps in between. The character's only around for four seasons, and within that time he proposes to Zoe, his social worker, and Alan, which is, is it's a long story. He also refers to several different women as the one. It's just kind of painful to watch. What makes it even worse is the fact that Ashton Kutcher seems to have very little to no chemistry with each and every love interest he's given, including one played by his very own wife. How does that even, what? Also, despite being a technical genius, he's a social moron. He's immature, he's naive, and just overall completely unsure of his surroundings. Now, this character sounds bad, but honestly, it's, it's really not all that bad. Ashton's a very charismatic fella and a beyond likable person, and that is, to me at least, very visible in his portrayal of Walden Schmidt. The duality of this character being computer savvy but a personal alien was played off in a somewhat believable manner, so I gotta give Kutcher credit. It's only through his friendship with Alan and interactions with the new cast of characters in his life that he's able to really evolve and mature. And it's through this new friendship and bond between Alan and Walden that one learns to cope with the death of his brother and the other learns to live life without his high school sweetheart. I know there are some people who didn't like his role in the series, and I totally get that. His appearance completely shifted the tone and changed the pace of the series. You see, Two and a Half Men was designed as a Charlie Sheen vehicle, meaning that with him leaving the driver's seat, it was going to be completely retailored to the next driver's liking. Which is why the series goes from feeling like Wall Street to suddenly feeling like what happens in Vegas. Honestly, I like Walden Schmidt. Uh, to a degree. See, I actually happen to be in a minority that likes season 9 of the show. I find it really enjoyable. Season 10 was alright. I enjoyed it, I mean not as much as season 9, but it, it was okay. But by time season 11 comes around, it just kind of seems like the magic's gone. In season 11, Walden's character felt like he already completed his short arc and he was now patiently waiting in limbo for the program to finally end. At this point, he'd already matured and smartened up socially. There was no need for Alan to still be in the house. He'd completed his journey, it, it, it was time to take the next step. Whatever that may be. Even if it means putting on a terrible fake accent and living with Danny Masterson on a ranch. Which apparently it did! The more time that passed, the more boring Walden became. And just two seasons into his run, the character lost all his charm. He became bland, he was pretty much a blank slate. His character began to lack purpose and Ashton just began to lack direction. It seemed like the writers just didn't know what to do with this character at this point in time. Like they used up all their good ideas in the first two seasons he was around. It was a sad departure of an era that seemed like it started off strong. I like to think of Walden Schmidt as Ashton breathing new life into the series, but that life immediately being put on life support. If the show was a raft, yeah, you could hop on it and swim across a pond, but I wouldn't be taking it to Niagara Falls, you know what I mean? Ashton did a good job with what he was given, but Walden Schmidt clearly had an expiration date, and much like Alan in the Beach House, he overstayed his welcome. I understand how some people may not be a fan of Ashton Kutcher's performance, but do you know who else wasn't really a fan of Ashton Kutcher's performance? Charlie Sheen, who took every chance he got to throw the former Mr. Demi Moore under the bus. And here's a hype package I put together based on their interactions. You can consider this the build for their would-be WrestleMania match. Sheen out! Kutcher in! Ashton Kutcher is ready to replace Charlie Sheen on the hit TV series Two and a Half Men. Charlie Sheen is running the clip operation back there. Turn it back on, Charlie! Let's go, Charlie! Run the clip! Run the clip! Winning. Winning.
all gonna just get together and uh, we're gonna watch two and a half minutes. You know, something that I that I that I left behind. Yes. That I spent a lot of time on. A lot of a lot of passion was poured into. A lot of energy. A lot of love. I, I'm, I'm rooting, but I am curious as hell. I'm curious to see where this thing goes, you know? What would you say to him? I would just, uh, I would just give him a hug and just say, make me proud, bro. Yeah. That's what I would do. Make me proud, make me proud bro. bro. I am not Charlie Sheen. Every day when you go into work, do they say, thank you for not being Charlie? It seems the former Two and a Half Men star has started watching the sitcom again, and he does not like what he sees. I'm tired of lying. I'm tired of pretending like the show doesn't stop. I'm tired of pretending like action doesn't stop. I just kind of stop listening to things that Charlie Sheen says. <laughs> I've got an awesome job, and it's thanks to you not having it anymore, so thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going to work and collecting the check. He tweeted this picture of Ashton and co-star John Cryer writing, Hey, John, you're a genius. Question, who is your lame sidekick? Nice try, Cannon Boy. Charlie Sheen has become like a parent on Charlie Brown to me. It's more like wah, 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 wah. Oh, good grief. I'm Charlie. Nice to meet you. Hey, relax, everyone. Read the hashtag. Oh, and John, I'm so sorry I insulted your sidekick. I meant really lame. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Hey Ashton, sorry bro, all good. Now quit barfing on my old brilliant show. Wah, 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 wah. Perhaps if Warner Brothers spent as much time and energy focusing on their show, it wouldn't be such a steaming pile of ass. I'm in a public plea right now with Charlie. Dude, shut the f up. <laughs> if you ever tell me to shut the f up again, I'll put you in a hospital food diet for a year. You feel me? Wah, 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 Charlie wah, Sheen, wah, shut wah, it wah. down. <laughs> Three years later, and you're still blowing me up on Twitter? Yeah. Come on, dude, really? Crew is big and it keeps getting bigger. That's because Jesus Christ is my. The cast and crew were dealt a pretty rough deal when Charlie Sheen had to leave the show. And only a year later, lightning would strike twice. Like his on screen uncle before him, Angus T. Jones, the actor who played Jake, took to YouTube to badmouth the show. Jake from Two and a Half Men means nothing. He is non-existent character. Angus, I'm not sure, really cares a whole lot about an, being an actor or being well-known in that regard. <sighs> two and a Half Men, if you watch Two and a Half Men, please stop watching Two and a Half Men. I'm on Two and a Half Men, I don't want to be on it. Uh, I don't regret saying what I said. Please stop watching it. Please stop filling your head with filth. Please. He's a wonderful kid. The show was, I don't know what. Uh, he, called it and, he called it filth. He called it filth. I was uh, trying to be nice about it. A lot of people don't like to think about how deceptive the enemy is. That's right. It's way more. He's been doing this for a lot longer than any of us have been around. People say it's just entertainment. Do some research on the effects of television and your brain. It's bad news. It's bad news. This was like getting punched in the stomach right after being kicked in your two and a half men. Angus called the show filth and practically begged fans to stop watching it. He exclaimed that you cannot be a God-fearing man and still be fond of the series. Which is strange because he claimed to be a lover of God, but he also actively contributed to that show. So I don't know, maybe, maybe God's just a hypocrite. Or maybe Angus is. Angus referred to two and a half men as being entertainment made by the enemy. So I guess he's basically saying that it, it's satanic or, or something, but he also goes on to talk about the effects that entertainment has on the brain. He was about three sentences away from going into a Tom Cruise rant. I'm just saying, but but aren't there Matt, examples where it Matt, works? Matt, Matt, Matt. You, you don't even, you're glib. And I gotta say, that's definitely a weird way to react to a franchise that made you $350,000 per episode. Look, I'm not saying you can't have faith. Go ahead. Do it up! Put Christ back in Christmas! Hang crucifixes in every goddamn room in your house! But don't go and lose a good paying job over it! What are you doing, August?! Jake's role in the show was already diminishing due to his newly found religious beliefs. The show allowed him more time off to pursue his own spiritual path, writing him out of his lead role and giving him a more reoccurring run. The write-off is explained as Jake having joined the army, which is a plot that seems a bit rushed, but also, even if it wasn't, would make no sense regardless. Jake would never be able to meet army requirements. 
The kid's a burnout who had maybe about five working brain cells to begin with, and he smoked at least three of them away. But hey, there needed to be an excuse for Angus not appearing on TV, so I guess whatever's convenient. After a season of only occasionally being present, Angus made his voice heard and his opinion known, as previously stated. After his comments on the show, it was revealed that he wouldn't be leaving the program, but he would be used in a lesser role. However, despite this, he still didn't appear in season 11, and didn't appear in the series final season outside of a brief cameo in the finale. I'd also like to comment that Angus somehow found Christ after becoming the Amazing Atheist. It's funny how things work out sometimes, huh? The show was definitely impacted by the loss of Jake, and it was robbed of a chance to see him progress, but it seemed like they were running out of ideas of what to do with him anyway. Now don't get me wrong, I like Jake. Hell, I even liked Jake when they dumbed him down and zooted him up. It was still funny to me. But Jake, Jake who has all the charisma of a broken broom suddenly becoming a ladies man like his uncle? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that one. I can't, I, I, I can't co-sign that. I'm not, I'm not getting on board that shit. The army story was a little far-fetched, and I don't think it necessarily did anything for him outside of getting him away from the show for a bit. Anyway, Angus's absence in the series only further alienated the show's audience, as the series was now hardly recognizable from what it once was. There was no more Charlie, no more Jake. The show that was centered on two and a half men suddenly only had one man, but with more Ashton Kutcher. Now, in all this madness, you may be thinking, what did Charlie Sheen think of all of this? Charlie, of course, used this time to blame young Angus's outbursts on the show creator Chuck Lorre and the quote-unquote toxic environment he cultivated. Have you spoken to Charlie, though? Do you know how he's doing? I do not. Okay. Thank you, Angus. Sorry to bother you, man. Some fans of SpongeBob SquarePants describe the seasons after the movie as being Squidward torture prawn. And it's not an inaccurate description either. The same could be said for the later seasons of Two and a Half Men. It plays out like Alan Harper torture prawn. Alan was always the butt of the jokes, but at least he was somewhat dignified. And I do say somewhat with quotation marks and several lines underneath, and also a little asterisk at the side. Somewhat. He was fun to laugh at, sure, but there was still a very human quality to him. Despite being a broke-ass cheapskate, he was still shown to be compassionate and empathic. He seemed like a good guy that was down on his luck. But by this point in the series, flanderization had taken over and made him just a mooch. The man was a parasitic leech, latching onto anything that came within sneezing distance. Season 9 does at least kind of remind us that he's still that guy. He puts Walden's needs before his own, choosing not to sell Walden's expensive wedding ring, or even ask him for money when he's in a rough patch. Later on, he's given the opportunity to cheat on Lindsay with candy. An opportunity he doesn't take. But that's it. Past that, he's just... He's horrible. For the most part, he no longer possesses most of his likable qualities. It's as if the show no longer wanted us to like Alan. And at least in-universe, no one did. Seriously, in the Ashton Kutcher version of the series, nobody likes Alan. Literally, no one, not a soul. Every new character that's introduced practically loads his very existence instinctually. Seriously, everyone in Walden's life hates Alan for simply coming into contact with him. Walden's ex-wife Bridget hates Alan. Walden's girlfriend Zoe hates Alan. Walden's girlfriend Kate hates Alan. Even Walden's mother hates Alan. And that's despite giving him a handy dandy. It's, it's a long story. I'm not, I'm not gonna... I don't care to go through it right now. Alan is made that much more pathetic in Charlie's absence. And his sole mission in this show, his only role is that of punchline. And what's really sad is that John Cryer is the highlight of the last seasons of the show. And yet, despite that, his screen time is spent with him getting shat upon. Um, not sexually. What the, fuck? the last seasons of the show are pretty confusing ones. It seemed like the writers were just throwing what they could at the wall and hoping that something stuck. So many plots are created and either left unresolved or are just completely disregarded. Walden's friend, played by Patton Oswalt, becomes a reoccurring character and it's revealed that he's now dating Walden's ex-wife, Bridget. Except, I don't think that they ever appear together on camera at the same time. And then she just ends up eventually dumping him several episodes later, off-screen. So the purpose of that was... what? I don't know! 
Rose seems to become obsessed with Walden as she once was with Charlie. She pops in randomly and is shown to be spying on him, but nothing really ever comes of it. She was also shown to join forces with Bridget at the end of an episode. It's never mentioned again. What's even stranger is that her obsession with Walden makes even less sense when it's revealed in the final episode that Rose didn't kill Charlie, and instead she kept him at the bottom of a well in her dungeon. Now, I, I know that sounds out there, and it is, but, um... No, actually, no, I, I, don't, I don't have any justification for that. The point being, what was it that she wanted from Walden anyway? I don't know! And what about Kate? I don't know! There are so many other examples of stories never getting resolved, but I think the biggest example is the series finale. We're not given a direction for any of the main characters' lives. Nothing really changes here. Alan and Walden still live in the beach house. Alan and Lindsay are seemingly broken up despite them getting engaged just a few episodes before. And Walden's not even in a long-term relationship. Everything's just the same. In that regard, at least, this is one of the most disappointing series finales of all time. The show also felt handicapped by its own title. The higher-ups kept trying to play to the gimmick. At first, it was Charlie, Alan, and Jake that made up the two and a half men in two and a half men. But then Charlie leaves, so now Walden is the other man. But then Jake leaves, so they have Hannah Montana come in to take his place, but she doesn't agree to do that, and instead they invent Jenny as the new half-man. Then, they decide Jenny's just not doing it for them, and they introduce Lewis as the new half-man. Who are these people? I guess I should probably explain some, some of what I just said. With Jake leaving the series and Charlie's presence still missed, the show created Jenny, Charlie's illegitimate daughter. While her placement in the series was to become the new half in Two and a Half Men, she was also meant to take the torch from Charlie and continue his legacy on the show. Jenny is pretty much just Charlie Harper's description copy and pasted into a new character bio. From the ribs of Charlie, Jenny was created. Might as well have just given Sheen a boob job and told him to tuck it back! Like Charlie, Jenny is a notorious womanizer with an alcohol problem. And that, for the most part, is her whole character. That's not to say anything bad about Jenny's actress Amber Tamblyn, who plays her part well. And she kinda owns the role. Jenny could have very easily come across as a tired rehash of her father before her, but instead she really makes it her own. But what I find most weird about Jenny is that she actually has limited interaction and banter with her uncle, Alan, and instead mostly bonds and bros out with Walden. She never even meets her cousin Jake. Ultimately, Jenny kinda feels like an unnecessary addition to the series. But she isn't an entirely unwelcome one. It's just kind of weird seeing yet another character come out of nowhere and join the main cast. Only to basically disappear the next season anyway. Jenny's around just long enough to wave high and by in season 12. Which brings me to the last season. In the opening episode, Walden has a heart attack and begins reevaluating his life. He decides he wants to have a child, but seeing as he's not great in relationships, as history has told us, he instead decides to adopt one. Nah, no, stop. Man, fuck this shit. Normally, this sounds like it'd be the plot for one episode, and that episode would end with Walden coming back to his senses. But no, that's not how this goes. This isn't a one and done. This is an actual season-long plot. In order to properly be considered for adoption, he decides to marry Alan. After the wedding, the adoption process begins, and eventually we're introduced to Lewis. And man, people did not care for this storyline, and neither do I. This character change in Walden felt a bit too extreme. I said previously that Jake started off as a plot device more than a character, but I may have to take that back, as Lewis makes young Jake look like an in-depth psychological study of a character. Lewis is only there to move the plot along and try to justify the series' name. Nothing against the kid actor playing him, though. He, he was fine. But all these changes in quick succession kind of makes the show feel a little bit lost. And I didn't even mention Barry. He, he didn't even make the cut for me to mention. It, it, it wasn't even worth it outside of this sentence. Also, with the older Harper gone, gone are the excess amount of drunk jokes. And in their place are a bunch of stoner jokes. It suddenly feels like every other episode on screen, somebody's smoking something. Which, of course, is the complete opposite of the earlier seasons in the show, because it was behind the scenes every episode that somebody was smoking something. And that somebody was Charlie Sheen. And that something was crack. I also found the last two or three seasons a bit too self-referential. Mila Kunis shows up and mentions that 70s show. Walden mentions marrying Mila Kunis. 
John Cryer dresses up as Ducky in an episode? I mean, don't get me wrong, I actually enjoy this type of humor. But the show began feeling a little bit too dependent on it. All the issues I've listed made for the perfect storm of awful, leading this once great series to go out with a whimper instead of a bang. Though let's be honest here, there was still plenty of banging going on. But if I had to give you one positive, I would say that with Charlie Sheen gone, there was now a lot more focus being put on the side characters. Herb and Lindsay were both show stealers, and I think they might have done their best work in the series in seasons 9 through 12. Seriously, they are the unsung heroes of this show. So contributing degenerates, let me know what you think I got right and what you think I got wrong in the comment section below. And as always, thanks for watching. Oh, and just so we're clear, no, I am not Charlie Sheen's son. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Alex Jones and we are breaking the conditioning. Now look, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm kind of retarded, which is why I liked and subscribed to the Social Injustice Warriors channel. I even clicked that little bell to stay notified. You have to look into it, people. But then I began to uncover what I believe to be a secret nefarious plot orchestrated by Zionist reptilians. Now, give me a second. Digging deep, I discovered that he wants you to quote, unquote, follow him on Twitter. Now, think about that for a minute. What kind of person, what sort of individual wants you to follow them? You know who else wanted people to follow them? The world's biggest Beach Boy fan, <laughs> Charles Manson. <sighs> Those who want to show their support, donate to the guy's Patreon for exclusive content. Now, why is it so exclusive? What's this guy hiding from the public? What do those Patreons see that the people of YouTube don't? Then I noticed he also has a PayPal. And just for the low price of $22 plus shipping, you can get yourself a SIJW t-shirt. Social Injustice Warrior. <laughs> so let's put this all together. He wants people to follow him, he calls you VTARDs, he wants you all to donate your money to him, and he wants all of you to wear the same clothing. So that just leads to ask, what kind of a hive-like cult is this man operating? V Infuso, <laughs> the social injustice warrior. <laughs> oh, are you clean right now? Look at me, duh. When was the last time you did drugs? Don't remember, don't care.